Hi, Jeff Geisinger here, and welcome to the fourth video in our Diva 4.0 tutorial series. In today's tutorial, we'll have an introductory look at annual climate-based metrics using the new Grasshopper components for Diva. So the goal will be to analyze the daylight autonomy for a simple open office, and we're using the example office Rhino file that we've used before. We'll be modifying the layer structure a little bit. We'll keep the shell layer group turned on, but we'll turn off the detailed interior layers. So we, we won't be including any detailed interior partitions or furniture in this simulation. We will be looking at some of the grids that are predefined in the Rhino file, and those objects are on the grid sublayer of the simple open layer group. If we take a closer look at these grids, I'll go ahead and preview this in shaded mode and I'll turn off the ceiling temporarily. You'll see that these are modeled as surfaces and that we have sort of subgrids for what we anticipate to be the lighting control groups for our model. So we have a grid group for the corridor and we have a sort of middle grid and we have a grid that's close to the, to the perimeter of our building. One important thing to note for the grids is that they are also modeled as services so that the normals or the, the vectors perpendicular to these services are pointing up. And I can check this by typing in the, the direction command, DIR. So if I select some of these grids, you'll see that the directionality of the surface normals is pointing up. And that's important because this is going to dictate the directionality of the, the sensors that we'll be using to simulate the annual climate-based metrics. And these need to be pointing up. I'll turn the ceiling back on. We need to make sure that all of this, the objects that we want to simulate are turned on in Rhino because we will be using the include Rhino geometry option for our simulations in the grasshopper component. And as with before, we will have to have this file set up for a Diva simulation in order to include those Rhino objects in, in our simulation. So we'll have to have already pressed the location button, which I have, and our material assignments already need to be placed. So as I um, activate the assign materials option, you'll see that my, my a few of the default radiance materials are already assigned, and I'm only really considering the shell uh, objects in this particular tutorial. To begin, I'll open up Grasshopper. And under the Diva 4 Components tab, under the Simulation panel, I'll place the Annual Daylight component onto the canvas. And I'll begin by giving our simulation a name. So I'll place a panel on the canvas and name this particular simulation Open Office backslash No Shade. And the reason why I want a backslash is that this will create, under the open office folder, a new subfolder called no shade. So when I run subsequent variations, I can change the name of the folder after the backslash, and it will I'll have a separate folder for each variation. For this particular one, though, I'll, I'll call it no shade because I won't have any shading elements in my simulation um, for this particular tutorial. Next, we'll place a daylighting grid component onto the canvas in order to set up our grid. You'll see that this grid component has a geometry input, which is where I can reference the geometry to base th this grid off of. And we'll use the, that reference geometry that we had already set up in the Rhino file. So I'll place a, since these are services, I'll place a BREP component onto the canvas, and I'll right click on this and say set multiple BREPs. Now, because I want to use all of these grid objects in, in our simulation, in order to select them quickly, I'll just right click on the grid, on the layer that contains them, and, and say select objects. This will select all of them, and I'll press enter in order to accept. And then I'll go ahead and input the BREP output into the geometry input. And I'll turn the preview off for the time being. After I plug in the geometry, you'll see that there's a preview grid now in the Rhino viewport, and it has a predefined default setting for the grid spacing. And that's where we can um, override that grid spacing here in the grid component under the spacing input. The default is 0.45 meters, and I'll place a panel on the canvas. And for this tutorial, I'll, I'll set this as one meter. For doing more final simulations, and especially for uh, lead credits, the spacing should be at most 0.6 meters, or about two feet. But for this tutorial, I'll, I'm okay with a coarser spacing. 
Now, one thing to note about the previewed grid that we see in our Rhino viewport is that it, it previews as white. And if we, um, if we zoom to the underside of that grid, you'll see that it previews as black. And now this will confirm the, the normal vector direction of our grid services to make sure that they're oriented in the right way. So the, the fact that they're white means that the, vec the normals are pointing up, which is correct for what we want to do for our simulation. If they were black on the, on the top, we would know that we'd have to flip those normals in order to have the grids pointing up in the right way. Great, and now we need to plug the grid output into the grid input. Next, for the objects in the scene, we won't be overriding any, we won't be placing any custom object assignments using Grasshopper components in the simulation, and we won't be inputting any specific windows using Grasshopper components. We'll just be using the include Rhino scene for this tutorial. So, as with previous tutorials, I'll type in a Boolean toggle to set that to true. For the location, we'll be using the default location for the Boston weather file, and for the quality settings, we'll also use the low quality settings for this run. And I will place a button onto the canvas in order to run the simulation. So I'll go ahead and run the simulation. And because I have a large amount of grid points and I'm using the low settings, which is fast but not the fastest, this simulation might take a few minutes. And in the meantime, I'll pause the recording and return when, I'm, when it's complete. All right, when our simulation has finished running, we can utilize the outputs in the Grasshopper component, the annual daylight component, to analyze the data and preview the results back into the Rhino viewport. We'll begin by first placing a panel onto the canvas. And we'll plug in the output into this panel. And this is just a summary of the, of the run that we did. And it will also tell us the results directory. So it will indicate where on our computer our result files are being saved. And for all the subsequent data analysis, the Grasshopper component will be referencing some of the files that it saved in this results directory in order to analyze the data in Grasshopper or preview it in the Rhino viewport. So let's go ahead and preview some of the results in the viewport. And to do that, we'll use the grid output in this component. Under the Grasshopper components tab, under data, we'll place the grid viewer component to preview our results in the Rhino viewport onto our, our, onto our analysis grid. So we'll plug in the grid output into the grid input, and you see that the false color results from our analysis are now being previewed on our grid in the Rhino viewport. And if I make the, the window a little bit bigger, you'll see that in addition to the false color results, we also get a legend for the metric that we're using. So by default, we are simulating daylight autonomy, and so that's the percentage of the occupied hours where any given point is receiving greater than 300 lux our threshold illuminance level. And so these results are a per our percentage between zero and 100. And you can see that based on the false color distribution on our analysis grids, we have a relatively high daylight autonomy for our floor plan. We have close to 100 around the perimeter, almost all the way to the halfway point of our floor, floor plan. And then we, we get still some high values in the yellow and orange range, which is over 50% near the core. And now this makes sense because our example office file that we're using has floor to ceiling glazing, and we haven't yet assigned any shading to our model in order to protect the interior from direct solar exposure. So it makes sense that we have very high daylight autonomy for our floor plan. Now we can indicate the, we can numerically understand what our overall spatial daylight autonomy is for the floor plan. So the overall percentage of our floor area that has a daylight autonomy value of 50% or more. And so I can do that by plugging in the SDA output into our panel. And if I hover over the SDA output, you'll see that it also indicates what that number is. And you see that this number is quite high. It's 96.7%. So generally, that our entire floor plan is well daylit, except that we likely have many areas that are overlit. And one way to indicate that is by using this ASE, or annual sunlight exposure metric, so we can understand what areas of our floor plan are receiving direct sun. And so this metric is telling us the percentage area of our floor that 
for more than 250 hours of the year are receiving greater than 1,000 lux. And this, is, this particular output is only sh showing our results for zero ambient balances, so it's really just looking at direct sunlight. It's just taking that into account for this particular metric. And what's also important to note for this metric is that dynamic shading or any kind of blinds or shades that we'll be using later for our windows are not going to be taken into account. This metric does take into account fixed shading strategies, uh, but not any blinds or shades that are, are movable. Now these two outputs, SDA and ASE, combine to form um, part of the criteria for the lead daylight credit. And this component will also output lighting energy, so the annual lighting energy used. Now the, the grid input has hidden inputs that if we zoom in and we can expose them um, as a list, as a sort of drop-down list. And here we have a, a wide range of particular inputs that we can set up for our simulation. And one of them is the lighting, the lighting control system and the lighting power density that Diva, that the annual daylight component will take into account for, anal for computing the lighting energy consumed throughout the year. And we can set that here. We're using the default value. We used all the default values for our simulation. But you see that there's also a, a larger list of inputs that you can change in order to customize your specific simulation. And of course, we, we're just using the, the defaults for now. So these next two outputs, open percentage and windows as list, we won't be looking at for this tutorial, but these come into play when we input windows, uh, when we utilize the grasshopper component for windows and define windows that have a specific material and shading control. Um, we can then understand how open that, what the open percentage of that shading is for this particular window. And then we can also, we can also preview the schedules for the shading for a particular window using these two components. I'll um, go ahead and take that off. Now, we have a high amount of daylight autonomy for our, for our simulation, and we also probably have a lot of overlit areas. So we can preview that onto the analysis grid in our Rhino viewport by changing the preview settings in this grid output component. So I'll go ahead and click on the preview setting for this. And you can see that we can change the annual metric that we want to, to preview in the Rhino viewport. Now by default, it's previewing the daylight autonomy. But if, for example, we want to highlight overlit areas, we can click on the daylight availability, which is essentially the same as daylight autonomy, but it will provide a highlight of pink over the areas that for over 5% of the year, those sensors that are receiving greater than 3,000 lux. So you can see that there are a large, there's a large percentage of the perimeter area of our of our building that is overlit, and we can, in subsequent tutorials, we can take a look at how applying shading to our windows, we can cut off some of these overlit areas and try to maintain a, a good amount of daylight autonomy through the depth of our floor plan. So that wraps things up for this tutorial. Please stick around for the next one where we'll look more closely at these windows in order to provide shading for our example office to control some of the overlit areas. Thanks a lot.